All right, I just let a couple more people in, so I, I think we'll get started. Um, welcome everybody to the presentation about Oregon Conservation Innovative Grants. My name is Misty Beals. I am the C Programs Manager for Oregon. So CIG, CIG falls under that. So leading the presentation today with Chris Martin. I'll let him introduce himself. Yeah, my name is Chris Martin. I'm a management analyst. I've been working on <clears throat> grants and agreements for NRCS Oregon for 19 years now. And uh, my aim in this is less programmatic and more bureaucratic to make sure that applications are complete, budgets are accurate, and that uh, we don't get ensnared by any of the uh, federal grant agreement or appropriation law rules in any of our applications or agreements. All right, thanks, Chris. So let's go ahead and get started. Um, today, you know, we're gonna have a little bit of an agenda here. It's not gonna be super long. We're gonna talk about, you know, kind of the background, the um, eligibility, what categories we're looking for with these CIGs, um, how to, you know, kind of get your budget started, how we evaluate, and then what makes a successful and not so successful proposal. Um, you'll see this slide a couple times just to remind you the deadline is it's actually midnight Eastern Standard Time, but we wanted to make sure everyone here knows get it in by nine o'clock May 13th. So a little bit of background and information about conservation innovative grants. Um, this was authorized, reauthorized from the 2014 Farm Bill to the 2018 Farm Bill. bill. It's a voluntary program, so we're just looking for, um, you know, those partners that that are innovative and want to do these cool projects. Um, the projects, you know, they can be farm based, so it can be an individual applying, be multi county, statewide. Uh, there is a national CIG program that is a little bit bigger and encompasses a little more area, but we're talking about the statewide one here. Um, and we do not fund research other than the exception here on the next page. Um, we can do on-farm conservation research based off the criteria here. Um, you know, you have to have a valid study design, um, number of replications and statistical analysis of the results. So there, there is that exception. If you're looking that way, let's start that conversation early so we can talk about that. Um, eligibility, so to participate in CIG, you must be one of the following, you know, a federal, federally recognized tribe, state or local government, non-governmental organization, individual. So we've had partners in the past like Oregon State University, Ecotrust, uh, private landowners, Oregon Department of Forestry, Portland State University. Um, and then, you know, the second part of it is be located in one of the following areas. So we stole this slide off of a national one. So projects for this state CIG must be located in Oregon uh, for this, this particular application. A little bit more on eligibility, you need to be equip eligible. So that means some paperwork with Farm Service Agency um, and they can help walk you through that process. Um, you know, I always say start local with your local district conservationist in the area you're thinking of doing work and they can help you with that eligibility with Farm Service Agency also. Everyone seeing the title slide, sorry. I didn't do this very good. <laughs> so here is the one located in Oregon, sorry about that. have to have equip eligibility and that's with Farm Service Agency, of course. Um, we're looking for those cool ideas, projects that necessarily aren't in our toolbox. So with those innovative new ideas that our partners are coming up with, um, you know, the promising technologies, practices, systems, et cetera. So that's kind of what the conservation innovative grants are about. Um, you know, this slides in here. So we want you to have thought this through. This is something that's been thought about. It's not just a trial and error necessarily. It's something that's, you know, we have a good 
chance of success and we'll, we'll evaluate it in the end based off of some of that information you provide us, uh, the thought process and uh, on farm work that's went into this. Matching funds, is this me, Chris, still? Okay, so uh, the way the state CIG works in Oregon is projects can be up to $100,000. We ask that uh, the partners provide 50% match of that. So that could be up to the 100,000 if you are going for the full 100,000. Um, you know, we want the match on a dollar per dollar basis and only 25% of that project in kind can be in kind. So uh, you can have up to 100% or 50% of cash, but only 25% of that total project cost can be in kind work. Misty, if I might, I might talk yes. a little bit about matching funds. Thanks. So the matching funds, as Misty has told us, half of uh, the project, we want skin in the game from the conservation innovators that you all are. And so it's 50-50 deal. And of your 50%, as it says there, uh, it has to be cash. So 25% of the total project cash you're doing is cash. 25% can be in kind for your match. Um, definition of match in 2 CFR 200, that's an important federal regulation, uh, governs on all our uh, all federal grants and agreements. But in the definition, it says cost sharing or matching means the portion of the project not paid by federal funds. <clears throat> so your federal, your match can't be paid by another federal award with another agency or our agency, that kind of a thing. Um, cost sharing is, uh, in 2 CFR 200.306, we are told has to be verifiable from the recipient's records, not included as a cost share in any other federal award, necessary and reasonable for the program and project objectives, and provided for in the final budget. Lastly, it has to be an allowable cost, and we'll talk about those things later as well. Um, the difference between a cash and an in-kind matching fund is in-kind would be like if we're talking about services first, services that your, your organization renders at no cost at a reasonable industry rate, that would be in-kind services. Um, whereas if you hire a contractor to do something as part of your project, that would be cash because you have a receipt, canceled check, uh, some kind of documentation of a positive outlay of cash by your organization. So that's what we're looking for when we just say cash versus in kind on services, on materials, um, cash if you buy the materials for your project, your demonstration, and um, in kind would be in kind materials would be things such as uh, woody debris uh, donated by the community for uh, for a habitat project or some such thing like that. So that's how we, we look at what's in kind versus cash. And those are the definitions for cost sharing. Back to you. Thanks, Chris. So um, these projects are usually between one to three years in duration. And so the way this cycle runs this year, plan on starting your project by September 1st. We'll get that grants and agreement part put into place with Chris and get started on these as soon as possible. And the max award, like we had already talked about, was $100,000. And I think we have about $300,000 in the state right now to fund these. So another thing about uh, you know, your equip eligibility, you're only allowed $450,000 per farm bill. So you know, the Ag Improvement Act of 2018 is we call the 2018 farm bill. So you're only allowed $450,000 per entity or individual. So keep that in mind if you apply for other projects through the EQIP program. Questions so far on kind of the background of this. All right, well, oh, Abby has her hand raised. Um, could you say again the part about what is allowed under research and what isn't? Oh yeah, I the slides. Probably where I forgot to announce the slides. So on-farm conservation research is allowed. 
um, and it, and I can read this to you, or, you know, it's, um, has to have a valid design, has to use farm scale equipment, so it's not a commercial project. Um, um, so it kind of explains it here. Does that help? Thank you. So like vegetation monitoring to see the changes after some implementation, that kind of thing. Yes. Would, yeah. Pass. Yeah, so we'll get into a little bit more of the accepted projects in a minute too. So I think that's one that, that uh, we've got to pass something very similar. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, on to proposal submissions. So you can get your applications at grants.gov. That's where you do most of your application at. And then a lot of those forms, a lot of the information is on the Oregon NRCS uh, homepage or webpage too. So there's a, some information there. Um, Chris is going to talk about the proposal submissions and the forms you need. The forms, isn't that exciting? Yeah, so um, in grants.gov, again, as Misty said, all these are available there. The third one down is critical. If you, if you don't have a system for award management registration, uh, your application gets bounced because that's how we register bank accounts so that we can pay you via EFT. We have an, an account linked to that registration. So it's not that we're trying to, uh, you know, monitor everybody's behavior and whereabouts. Um, it's just how we have to be able to pay. The 4.4 uh, without any letters after it is the general uh, application. It's called the application for federal financial assistance. And it has the, your entity's information, general information about the overall budget. Um, contact information for your agency and the description of the project. Whereas the SF-424A is a specific for your program. Um, it's important that they're accurate. Um, we'll get to some of the cost categories in that form later, but in your direct cost categories, you end up as a successful applicant, you get a project with us. You have to bill against those budget items. So if you said it was gonna be this much in personnel, this much in materials, and this much in supplies, they have to invoice the government in accordance with those budget categories. It's really important that we get it set right when it becomes the formal budget for the agreement. The executive summary, I think everyone's experienced in those. The project description, the budget narrative, once you've been on your categories, I'm going to figure that out, each category needs a paragraph that explains how you got to the number. So if you're saying this person's salary, 15% uh, of their salary over two years, um, and their salary is this, and that's how we got to personnel, our fringe benefit rate is this, and it consists of you know, vacation pay and health insurance, unemployment, whatever it has in it. And that's how we're going to present if it's contractual. We intend to hire somebody on the contractual side uh, to do this one part of our project. Um, and that's how we'll go through those direct cost categories. We'll talk about later, but she's going to develop a short paragraph uh, explaining how, you know, showing up so we can determine the reasonableness of those numbers uh, before we set it in stone. And the declarations are things that Misty knows more about. Perfect. Uh, so when you're completing that eligibility for you you have to be a farmer or, um, you know, you have to declare that you've got that paperwork in to be eligible for EQIP. So that's that part of it. Um, so look here a minute at project description, seven pages max, have a slide on um, what can be in there right here. Um, this is your narrative. Here's a list of things we would like to see in there. So your project background, um, some maps, uh, your timeline, how you're going to manage this, the deliverables that are going to come out of this, because that's what we're really looking for with these projects is something usable at the end. Um, the benefits, transferability, um, you know, and then have a couple slides on environmental impacts. So um, we'll talk about that too. So another thing that we said is uh, some of your, this were already set forth by Oregon. No particular order of what we're looking for to how are you addressing these sorts of variables? The seven that came out that floated to the top based off leadership's discussion for these projects, um, energy, air quality, quality. Uh, so kind of become a big thing recently as fair change, uh, quality, quantity, plant health vigor, soil quality, and wildlife or habitat or livestock production. So um, just keep that in mind. And I think these slides will be available on our website after this, this is too, so. So in your submission, this is the fun part. Um, we need to have an assessment of the environmental impact. So how is this a 
affecting the environment? Are there, are there going to be some uh, drastic results that come out of this? Are, um, we just want to know what's going on out there that can affect this. So put that in there. I would like to get into it a little deeper with environmental compliance. Um, so I'm going to read these. These are very important. Those with potentially adverse impacts to natural resources may need to be modified or to achieve an acceptable and beneficial level of environmental impact. So one thing we're going to go through when we rank and prioritize these. And then number two, just know that um, your project must comply with the National Historic Preservation Act. And we're going to we'll do that review in-house. So um, if you were to get a project, that review has to happen. And I have a so this is part of the NEPA requirement and then part of the um, National Historic Preservation Act. If your application is selected for funding, we internally will do the NEPA part and evaluate that. Um, but also know that if there's a lot of adverse effects, the selected applicant will be required to prepare and pay for the preparation of the appropriate NEPA documents. So if you have to do an environmental assessment or an EIS, then that is on the applicant. So a little bit about cultural resources and uh, you know how this part works. We're going to do the National Resource Preservation Act review on our end. We will do that according to NRCS rules um, at 36 CFS Part 800. Um, and we cannot delegate this out. So this will be us doing this. Um, if the, it, during this process, or efforts, the activation project, but we'll work through that with the applicant. So just know those things are out there and it's a big deal and we are going to look at those. Budget information. So we we'll have Chris here for budget. Yeah, what do you have there? What do you have after that slide? Oh, yeah. So we'll, well, then we'll do this one right here. Yeah. Um, you'll see there are project costs are, um, are as you said, two hundred thousand federal dollars project. Project costs, total project costs are consist of direct costs plus interest costs. Direct costs are your labor and materials that are incorporated directly into the project that you're working on. Whereas indirect costs are those costs of your organization that override and apply to all your projects, such as office rent, telephones, internet service, lawyers, all the things that you, uh, you, you pay to keep an organization running, but don't apply to any specific project, but instead apply to all. And so indirect costs, if you are a nonprofit, you should know our appropriation limits indirect costs to 10%. Um, so, uh, if you need help with that budget and constructing that, I'm always available to do that. Uh, at Chris.Martin at USDA.gov. But um, we can help you formulate through the difference between indirect and direct costs. Make sure your budget is. Can you use? Well, here's some examples. They kind of CFR 200.400. Again, 2 CFR 200 is the body of regulations that you need to take a look at. But uh, they're, pretty, they're pretty understandable. Alcohol. Yeah, we're not buying that. Um, bad debts are authorized costs, your bad debt expense. Uh, defensive criminal prosecution. Yeah, you can't put that in your grant. Idle facilities or capacity. Um, losses in other words and contracts. You can't tag us with other losses and use that as a cost. Or pre-award costs. So it's important that if your application is selected, that you do not begin work until uh, the agreement's fully executed so that you can be compensated for those costs because pre-award costs aren't authorized. Back to you, Misty. All right. So uh, proposal submissions, please let us know if you've had a previous EID or been involved in it, even if it wasn't directly. Let us know. And that includes the national sign-up. Um, Proposal submissions again. I want to make sure you guys get this. 8:59 Pacific Standard Time on Friday, May 13th is when these are due. And you can submit through. You have to submit through Grants.gov. Um, if you do fax, email, or mail, they will not accept. So keep that in mind. Any questions on proposal submissions? Misty, I have to go back to Patton and mention that was on that slide, and I skipped it. Sorry. Yeah. You were eagle-eyed there. I wasn't. That was my bad, I'm sure. The neat thing about the patent and invention is you just need to realize that if you come up with something patentable, um, that's great. You can sell it to the world. That is your patent. What does that paragraph notes? We don't uh, 
uh, sell it, <laughs> but um, we get to use your idea. So you could sell it to everybody else except the government. And that's because we helped fund it uh, in all fairness and equity. Uh, we of course would then be able to use that bright idea uh, without further charge. Anyway, that's all I wanted to add on that. Oh, so Abby, I see your question. Abby, you can. Um, we call it a NICRA, the Negotiated Indirect Cost Rate Agreement, but the uh, if you're a dot .org, it doesn't matter that you have a NICRA that's over 10%, you can only get 10%, and that's because our own appropriation at NRCS uh, has language in it that when we do grants and agreements with non-for-profits, that we cannot pay more than 10% in indirect costs. So we have what's called the minimum indirect cost rate grant. Uh, you sign that, it applies only to this project, and it at least assure you the 10% indirect costs. Now, if you're not a not-for-profit, if you're some other type, they're like uh, higher education, um, but another group, commercial, uh, then you could use your NICRA. So if you have a 20 or 30% indirect cost rate that's been federally negotiated, you can use that. Also, you should know that we are allowed to count as match unreimbursed indirect costs. So if you're a .org and your indirect cost rate agreement with the federal government signed is for 20% and we limit you to 10, the other 10% that's unrealized and unrecovered by you for your indirect costs because of that limitation can be used as match. So there you have it. All right, any more questions on the proposals? All right, let's move on to the review process, how this works, how you get funded. So here's our priorities. You know, when we're looking at these applications, we're looking at projects that have been studied significantly sufficiently, um, you know, that you've done some tests, you've done some evaluations, you're meeting those resource concerns that we talked about earlier. Um, and we're just looking at, you know, improved technology, improved performance out there on the land. Um, so the way this works, these projects come into us, they get reviewed at the base and local level. That's why I said earlier, start, start with your local DC, start with your idea, you know, that local, process and then you know as, as we need to we can move up Chris and I can help you know etc but it's going to be reviewed at the local level to see how this fits in in that geographic region or the, the local work group of that area then the projects go up to our technical review so we have a whole entire technical staff up here at the state office and then from there it's going to go to leadership team and they're going to review these and kind of make the final decisions on these projects as long as they're technically sound and supported at the basin level. So transferability, that's kind of one thing we're looking for. So, you know, not all of us have the time to go out and be innovative and, and get these, you know, ideas going. So we're looking at, you know, help really. How can you help us? How can these transfer over to our standards and our job sheets and our tech notes? How can we use these in our everyday conservation world? So, so that's one thing we're looking for too. Um, if you want to look at uh, previous projects, I actually went in here and looked at these. There's some really cool projects um, in the database on the Orion webpage, so you can look at those projects. Um, I thought I had a list of them somewhere here. Maybe not. It's a good site to go, you know, just look at and get ideas on how people uh, implemented the CIG grants. So here's some things we're not looking for. We're not looking for solely research projects. Um, if you don't have EQIP eligible people involved, then, then, then it's out. Um, we're not looking for land acquisition. We're not doing workshops, uh, you know, and, and so you have to list here. Got to match, the match runs like a stock out. So here's our contact information uh, with our emails, phone numbers. So. Chris and I are available to help anytime. Antonio is our environmental compliance specialist. So if you have questions about those cultural resources or the EAs, the EISs, you know, Antonio will give us a help. And Mike Petroza is our state archeologist. So he'll be involved in that process if you get funded to uh, look at the SHPO and the National Historic Preservation Act piece of this. So 
there's that information. I just want to look at my next slide here is probably not as cool. So questions, questions on how these are evaluated. And like I said, remember we have $300,000 for the state this year, so. And Misty, I would add that um, in that evaluation process, grants and agreements at national level for FPAC does an entity review. So once we, even after you, the technical approval and the project's beautiful and lovely, they make sure that you're not delinquent on federal tax debt, disbarred from working with the federal government. They just do a cursory review, make sure you're not on Santa's naughty list with the federal government. But there is that additional layer, just saying. Perfect. And that, unless there's more questions, that's the end of our presentation. And please always contact us if you have questions throughout the process. So the question is, does it matter if the project complements existing equip funding? So I think I can complement it, but we're looking for something beyond what we're already doing. So it might, you know, if you have a, go ahead, Abby. Yeah, thanks. To clarify, um, I saw equip eligible, but if the, so if the activity is on a site where that site has already received equip funding in the past. Doesn't matter order of operations if they've already received equip funding, or if you if you want it to be on a site where they haven't yet applied for equip funding. Just trying to interpret that statement. Yeah. So one of the examples I had looked up and was reading about was um, sage grouse habitat monitoring. It was a metrics that uh, had come up. So we had done equip out on the landscape for sage grouse. But this new idea was to do, um, a me, um, what was it, a metrics of how to, how to inventory that success and what had already been done. So it, it can definitely complement it. Okay, great. That answers that question. Thank mm -hmm. you. Any more questions? Oh yes, let me copy that link real quick here for you. Thank you. Okay, there. And if you get just on our the Oregon homepage, uh, you can, you know, you can kind of go through the process and find the CIG webpage too, and it'll have, have that in there. Do farms applying on their own need a non-farm entity as part of, no. So individuals can apply for this program. So we've had a couple individuals in the past apply and be successful with CIG. 